Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Women in Science event, the third in a three-part series co-produced by Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News, or GEN, and the Rosalind Franklin Society. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Juliana Lemure, science writer at GEN, and I'll be your host. It's a pleasure and honor to have Dr. Fiona Murray, the William Porter Professor of Entrepreneurship and Associate Dean of Innovation and Inclusion at the MIT School of Management, joining us today. We'll have a chance to talk to Fiona in a bit about her path and what she's been up to recently at MIT. But before we get started, I'll pass it over to the Executive Director of the Rosalind Franklin Society, Carla Shepard Rubinger, who will tell us a little bit more about RFS. Carla, over to you. The Rosalind Franklin Society is again so pleased to be hosting this Women in Science series with our colleagues at GEN. The mission of the society is to showcase and promote the careers of women scientists worldwide. Many like Rosalind Franklin work tirelessly without recognition, but with an uncommon passion and commitment for their work. Dr. Franklin's now famous photograph 51 was the cornerstone of the discovery of DNA, but was given little recognition during her lifetime. Our speaker today has in fact received important visibility and recognition and is a model of creating a career across sectors. She and I were both fortunate to receive funding early on several years ago from the Kaufman Foundation in Kansas City, which was one of the early funders to recognize the need to support and train entrepreneurs, especially women and minorities. We're excited to hear about her path, her new work at MIT, her focus on innovation and invention, followed by an interview with Juliana and me, and of course, some time for audience questions as well. Thanks and back to you, Juliana. Thanks, Carla. Our guest today who received her PhD in Applied Sciences from Harvard is an international policy expert on the transformation of investments in science and technology into deep tech startup ventures that solve significant global challenges from defense to health, food, and water security. Her work includes understanding new funding approaches for innovations that arise from scientific research and educating the next generation of leaders to build effective ventures. In her work, Fiona has emphasized the ways in which women and underrepresented minorities are engaged in or excluded from innovation using large scale data analysis. Her research has explored the ways in which different approaches to evaluating early stage ideas can overcome the unconscious bias that she's documented. Today, she will talk with us about the power to innovate and the importance of including a more diverse array of perspectives to build a more just, equitable, and successful innovation economy. Before I pass it over to Fiona, I want to mention that we welcome your questions for her. So please just drop them into the Q&A of the Zoom, not the chat, and we will try to take as many as we can. Fiona, the floor is yours. Juliana, thank you very much. Thank you for that very kind introduction. And Carla, thank you also. Um, it's a real honor to be part of this um, seminar. Uh, and to be part of something that is joint uh, between the Rosalind Franklin Society and Jen. I feel quite a strong connection to both of these two partners. Um, the first, my connection to Jen, Genetic and Engineering News, that is a magazine that I have read for many, many years. And in fact, it's also a magazine that my husband reads. He's a biochemical engineer. He not only reads it on a weekly or regular basis, he also saves it. And so I think I probably have, you know, three or four feet of Jen archives. Um, sitting under my piano at home. And so I have a particularly personal connection to that. Um, my connection to the Rosalind Franklin Society is perhaps obvious. Um, like Rosalind Franklin, um, I'm from the United Kingdom, so I'm British. I also like her studied chemistry. Um, I studied at the other university, as we like to think of it in Britain. She was a Cambridge graduate. I went to Oxford and she obviously went on to an incredibly storied career as a chemist. I, on the other hand, took a rather different path doing engineering and then really thinking about the management of science and frankly, how we create the organizational conditions for scientists and innovators from many, many backgrounds to actually be effective and to make sure that their ideas, their inventions, their incredible creativity is both recognized and actually sort of contributes to the world in meaningful ways um, in their lifetimes. I think this is an especially fitting thing to think about given that I believe it's 101 years after Rosalind's birth. Um, she also thought, and obviously her work in X-ray diffraction was extremely powerful. 
And I still remember sitting with my um, master's thesis advisor, RJP Williams, who is a well-known chemist in the United Kingdom, who did a lot of X-ray diffraction um, and X-ray crystallography work um, back in the day, sort of sitting there measuring the peaks and what have you. So this is something that is very much resonates with me and I'm incredibly honored to be part of this. Uh, what I wanted to talk about is very much my own work thinking about and trying to understand how we meaningfully create the conditions for innovators and entrepreneurs from every background, whether we're talking about um, women, underrepresented minorities, you know, any um, underrepresented group, how we can understand their degree of participation in today's innovation economy, and how we can make meaningful change. I think this is important, not just to document the phenomena and document the ongoing challenges, but also start to understand what makes a difference and how we can do that. So what I thought I'd do is I would share some slides. I'm going to share some of my most recent work. Um, quite a lot of that is quite data heavy. So um, I'll go through some of the data reasonably quickly, but I'm very happy to share more about that um, with those of you who are interested in the results to several decimal places, which I suspect some of you might be. I'm going to talk about the generation and commercialization of ideas, and I'm going to talk about what I see as some of the barriers um, for women. So first, I just wanted to have a working definition of innovation. We talk a tremendous amount about innovation. I think it's very helpful to have a working definition uh, because otherwise it becomes a buzzword that we all use, but perhaps we don't think about in the most concrete way. At MIT, we define innovation as a process of taking ideas from inception to impact. Uh, we think about this as a process definition because it allows us to highlight the entire journey. It means that we don't have to focus on singular um, eureka moments or those aha moments very early on in that journey, but actually to recognize that there are many, many steps along the way. We use the word impact, and I think that's especially fitting in this context because we can think about impact in a variety of ways depending on what it is we're trying to accomplish. It might be that profit is one of the dimensions of impact, but it's often the case that the impact we want to have is on changing the health and well-being of individuals, um, on you know, impacting our climate and our planet, shaping our national security and our safety. So it's important for us as innovators to define what we're trying to accomplish. I also want to emphasize the idea that you know, ideas at the beginning are a match between a problem and a solution. Solutions looking for a home don't always get us where we need to be. Problems without those incredibly creative solution providers are also not adequate. And so it very much is that match. And as soon as we start to take that point of view, it's a match between a problem and a solution. It's a process of taking ideas from inception to impact. That reminds us that this is almost never about the lone genius, the lone individual. This is about teamwork. It's about multiple organizations. It's about transitions from one stage of the process to another. And so we have to engage many parties, academics, entrepreneurs, corporations, and so on. As we do that, we recognize that it's, again, not enough to be an incredibly clever, brilliant individual. It's about how we create conditions for those people to come together and be effective, how we create conditions for effective handoffs, and how we make sure that the structures, incentives, and cultures in our organizations and in our communities really allow for everybody to feel like they can play a part. And particularly that um, female scientists and engineers and innovators actually have a meaningful seat at the table. So I want to talk about some of what I see as the systemic barriers to diversity and inclusion across this whole innovation process. And obviously, when we talk about diversity, there are many dimensions we could talk about. I'm going to focus my attention today on gender. Obviously, there are some you know, primary identities that we might think about. It could be sexual orientation, ethnicity, age, race, and so on. Gender is something that I focus on for a long time. It's also something to be frank that I think is more widely studied, not least because we can, it's obviously more identifiable than for example, socioeconomic background. I would have said it's probably the first frontier, if you like, of inclusion, particularly in the scientific community. And there continues to be challenges, even as we have to and must think about inclusion of individuals who, you know, from many, many different backgrounds. But that's where I'm going to start. But I just want to make it clear that just because I'm talking about gender doesn't mean that I don't think it's important to think about these other uh, dimensions. So I don't think that, particularly with this audience, but frankly with anybody anymore, we really need to put you know, evidence around the economic imperative for diversity and inclusion in our innovation economy. But just in case we do, if you think about it purely from an economic point of view, it's incredibly inefficient 
to um, not use some of our talent pool. If we are educating uh, young women to be, you know, scientists and engineers, if we're educating this significant STEM potential workforce, it's incredibly inefficient for us to not then incorporate those individuals fully and meaningfully into our innovation economy, whether that be in academia, in uh, entrepreneurial ventures, or in large organizations or in government labs. And so if we have missing Einsteins, or frankly, more appropriately, missing Knights, missing Franklins, then, you know, if I'm just looking at this from a straight up um, economic point of view, then that's a really inefficient thing to do. To continue with this, more diverse teams we know incorporate more sources of information and have better outcomes and hire what my colleague Tom Malone would call collective intelligence. We also know that more diverse leadership of organizations leads to higher rates of performance. And that's just the economic evidence. That's not me talking about my own beliefs about what is appropriate and just. But if I have to give you an economic argument, I can do that. And I want to make sure that we do actually understand that. So we're not asking anybody to do any favors. We're actually saying this makes sense for us as, a, as organizations, as communities, um, as a country. Let me just talk a little bit about the early stages of innovation. So really in the scientific communities, there's some really interesting evidence that more diverse teams tend to search solution space more widely in science. Uh, my colleague James Evans at Chicago actually studied 65 million scientific papers over 60 years. So a lot of scientific papers to look at, showed that bigger teams advanced incremental science, but small diverse teams tend to drive novel far horizon, really sort of, let's call it breakthrough uh, thinking. We know that inventors and innovators and scientists who have more diverse backgrounds have different lived experiences, and they tend to search solution space more widely and actually focus on different kinds of problems. There's a really interesting paper from Hofstra um, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences this year that really does document the fact that um, women and underrepresented minorities tend in general to, to actually come up with ideas that combine more distant and disparate keywords to search solution space more widely, but on the other hand, get less credit when it comes to citations and what have you. So there's some very interesting massive data, I mean, real sort of data analytic work on this. And there's another very nice study um, by uh, Professor Joshi showing that you know, women more often than men tend to accurately recognize the expertise of fellow team members, find more novel solutions, get interrupted more. There's some pretty interesting work on how women get interrupted more than men um, when they're working in teams. But nevertheless, what this is telling us is not that um, our male colleagues don't have a profoundly important role in the scientific community and in our teams, but we need that balance. We need a mix. We need diversity of points of view, of lived experience, of education, of training. That's what we're really trying to accomplish. And there's ample evidence that that makes sense. When we come to the later stage of innovation, and so let me call this commercial science, there are a lot of different words we could use. One is you know, entrepreneurship. Um, I prefer to think about this as commercial science because I see this as a definition of saying, we're going from the earlier stages of that idea to impact process, which tends often happens in academia, and you might think of as kind of academic science, to moving those ideas out into the economy. And if we think about commercial sciences, including patenting and licensing of intellectual property, starting, but also advising uh, startup ventures going into the commercial sector, I think it gives us a broader window on the possible ways in which individuals can really make move their ideas out. But let me give you some um, evidence that again, I think you probably know. Um, we know that very little venture capital actually uh, goes towards female-led companies. But in fact, um, there's something incredibly inefficient about that, because actually of all the venture firms that scored in the top quartile of um, fund returns, 70% of them had women in decision-making roles. Um, and yet that remains a reasonably unusual phenomenon. Um, I do a lot of work with Mass Challenge, which is a very large accelerator based here in Boston. Um, there's some interesting work that found that women deliver sort of 2x more revenue per dollar invested. Um, even though only sort of 10% of venture deals go to female-led firms. So again, that suggests that there are basically ideas and opportunities being left lying on the table. A um, lot of evidence around this, and much of it getting, I think, increasingly good and precise about really the economic as well as the social loss of doing that. So one argument that has often been made is a pipeline argument. And I don't think we can rest on our laurels when it comes to thinking about the STEM pipeline. Um, particularly in fields of STEM beyond the biological sciences. 
So we think about mathematics and computer science, engineering, the physical sciences, there's still a ways to go if we're trying to um, think about parity and 50-50 as perhaps, you know, a, a gold standard. Um, we've obviously basically got there in the biological social sciences, um, but there's been quite significant progress. Um, and so it's very hard to make the argument that we don't have the appropriate number of talented individuals. And so the reason why we don't see, you know, women engaging in as much academic knowledge production and as much patenting um, and so on can't be explained by the fact that um, there are not enough women being trained in the early stages of the pipeline. And so I think it's really important for us to be able to sort of put that argument to rest, because if that's the debate where we sort of say this is what's happened, and so we can't really solve these downstream problems until we solve this big upstream problem, um, then we'd all just sit around and have to wait. And I don't think we need to wait, and I don't think we should be waiting. Um, we know that women have actually trained in STEM for centuries, but we continue to have missing inventors. So if I think about commercial science as taking ideas just that little bit further than uh, publication, you know, whether it's Ada Lovelace or Marie Curie, Margaret Knight, Marion Donovan, I mean, there are so many individuals that we could talk about um, who have actually either have the potential to take their ideas further towards uh, impact or who in fact have patented, started companies, but who have not really been recognized for doing that. We have, I think, missing um, inventors. There's some really interesting work that some colleagues of mine at Stanford have done, um, trying to look at you know, who really is an inventor in America. They, they talk about this as the lost Einsteins. They're looking at children um, in third grade and they're looking at their you know, uh, math scores and they're taking those kids that have top math scores and basically saying, these are the people who in the long run are likely to become inventors. And you can really see that, for example, by race, you know, there are some tremendous disparities. So kids who are black or Hispanic have a much, even if they have equally good math scores in third grade, have a much lower likelihood of becoming inventors later in their lives. If we look at this by economic, uh, by income, we actually see that kids who have in the low, you know, quintiles of income are much less likely to be inventors. But I think importantly, we also see this in gender. And so we see that women are three times less likely to uh, be inventors. And so we, we have, uh, missing inventors. I'm occasionally troubled by the fact that the study is called, it talks about missing Einsteins, because I think this actually just sort of plays into the fact that Einstein himself, you know, was, was basically, um, you know, a white man from a reasonably high income family at the time. And so I think that it's not the, the Einsteins who are missing. Um, you know, we have to think about this as the missing uh, Lovelaces or the missing Franklins, frankly. And so, um, and this data is actually confirmed in the study I did some time ago of academic patenting, which shows about a two and a half times difference in faculty likelihood of patenting uh, among faculty, male and female faculty in the life sciences. So definitely a gap. Um, I've gone on to do some work in this with my colleague, Professor Mercedes Delgado. Mercedes is uh, a professor at Copenhagen Business School at the moment, although I persuade her to come and spend time with me in, in Boston on a regular basis, because we have this really fascinating project that's looking at the entirety of the US patents that have been granted between 2000 and 2015. And we've been really interested in looking at male and female inventors, and also in new inventors, so people who come into that invention pipeline for the first time in their careers. We've been calculating these female inventor percentages because we had found that in the past when people looked at this, they were focusing on things like patents with at least one woman, just like people say startups with at least one female founder. And there's something slightly tokenist about that. And you can actually make yourself feel a lot better if you think about patents with five inventors. And as long as there's one woman, we can sort of give ourselves a pat on the back. And so our, our work has focused on the percentage of female inventors. And what you can see from this, data is the percentage of female inventors in the entire US kind of patent system is about 10%. And the, that number has gone up over the last 15 years, um, but it's gone up at a rate of less than 0.2% per annum. It's like 0.15% per annum. So that's a very, very slow increase in the participation of female inventors. If I look at new inventors, so women coming into the invention pipeline, the rate at which that's going up is um, a little bit higher, but it's still less than 1% a year. And so this is a very, very slow 
sort of change. And in fact, if we were just to let the system go at the same sorts of rates, it would basically take us almost 100 years uh, for patents with just one female inventor and 260 years for us to get to parity of female inventors. And I don't think we have that long to wait, frankly. And so we really have to think about what's going on. And again, we wanted to just show that this is not a pipe. We really wanted to nail this pipeline argument once and for all, so we never have to talk about it again. And so what we're trying to do here is actually compute the STEM PhDs and bachelors over the same time period uh, granted by gender. And so that dark top line that's uh, hovering around 37% is the percentage female STEM bachelors. And the orange line is actually the really important progress that we've made female STEM PhDs, um, again, over the last 15 years, going from 25% up to 35%. And that rather sad gray line that's hovering along the bottom is basically the line that shows the percentage of female inventors or the dotted one of the percentage of um, female new inventors. So you can really see that even though women are coming into, to, let's say, the, the bachelor and STEM PhD pipeline, that is not translating yet into real participation in uh, later stages of the innovation economy and things like invention and commercialization. I'm not saying that every single PhD student needs to do this. It, I'm not suggesting that every faculty member, every academic who publishes necessarily needs to patent. But I do think that women and men probably, if they have similar preferences, we ought to be seeing things that are either reaching parity or at least reaching the percentage of um, the PhD community. I also want to argue that this is not a matching problem. So you might tell me, oh, well, you know, there are a lot of women in life sciences, and so maybe we're seeing it there, but what we're not seeing, we're not seeing this in computers, and that's because we don't have enough PhDs there. And so I just want to show you, if you follow the pink line along my slides, the percentage of female new inventors in the drugs and medical patents are about 25%. So that's good. I think an encouraging number. And again, these are new inventors. So these are people you might think of who are either in their graduate careers, postdocs, just you know, newly out into the economy. But the percentage of female PhDs over the same time period is almost 50%. So even in a field like that, we have a gap. Computers and communications, 12% female new inventors, 20% of PhDs. So the gap isn't really just about STEM education choices. So we tried to set out and ask the question, where is the STEM talent actually uh, being used? And we actually wanted to ask the question about universities um, and whether or not we were doing better in universities than we are in the economy as a whole. And so we remember, you know, one sort of key fact, and I always have to uh, make sure I get my basic facts straight, otherwise Mercedes will be upset with me. Um, the, the, average, the percentage of female new inventors in the economy is about 14% right, over this 20, 15 year time period. Um, so we decided that we'd actually have a look. What does this look like inside universities? And so we were interested in the top 25 patent producing universities in the United States. This top 25 make up about 50% of the patents that are produced by universities in the US. And so what I've done here is basically rank those universities from top to bottom in terms of their female new inventor percentages. So imagine I've taken all the patents that MIT has produced and I've actually looked at the percentage of female new inventors in those patents. As I say, you can see that the US average is represented by this black line down here, so it's about 14%. The universities as a whole are significantly more inclusive, so somewhere in the region of 22%. Um, again, not a perfect number, um, but definitely higher. So this tells us that universities, perhaps because they are the tip of the spear, they are the people producing those new PhDs, are definitely more inclusive. But you can also see some pretty interesting variation by university. So if I just do this ranking, you'll see that somewhere like um, University of Pennsylvania is very high up, somewhere like Purdue, considerably lower down. MIT, my own institution, is in this ranking, 20th. Now, you might say, well, OK, but maybe one university does way more life sciences, and we know there are more women there than engineering. And so what we've tried to do is actually sort of then do some ranking of these universities and wait the kind of technical areas that they work in. And so if, if we can just about follow this chart, which is a little bit complicated, I think the most important thing to look at is the inclusivity index on the right-hand side. So take a look at that right-hand side column. What you'll basically see, right, because that allows us 
to actually sort of look across these different groups and compare the fact that MIT does lots of engineering compared to perhaps some other places, you'll see that the ranking does change. And so somewhere like MIT goes up because, you know, as a very technical institute doing a lot of computer science, we're actually doing relatively better. Northwestern is very high, Case Western still not doing so well as a sort of inclusivity index. I don't want people to take this away and say, oh, this is a terrible university, this is a good one. I think what this asks us and allows us to think about is who's doing well? What kind of policies do they have, right? How should we understand maybe some of what causes people to make progress over time? Are there some specific policies? Um, are there departments or fields where we really do see rapid change over time? And so the idea of coming up with these averages and these rankings is not to sort of name and shame people, but rather to shine a light in the window into what's happening. So we wanted to dig in from the university level to actually say to ourselves, all right, within these universities, we know that a very, very significant fraction of these patents are being produced by a very small number of faculty members, what we would call the PIs. Right? So the PIs on the grants, you know, the people running the labs are probably producing many, many of those patents. And so we actually started to look at what we call the top inventors. Those are people who've typically produced um, more than seven or eight patents over this time period. They're in the 90th percentile of the economy. Um, and we wanted to understand their behavior. Who, who are they? Are they male or female? And who do they include on their patents? So do they include who in their lab gets to be on the patents, gets to be part of these innovative patent producing commercial science research projects? So, Again, please focus on this top line. So we're looking at these top 25 universities. You can basically see, if you look at um, the female top inventors and the male top inventors. So there are about 2,200 top inventors in those 25 universities. About 10% of them are female. So that means of those inventors in those universities who are really producing the vast majority of the patents, about 10% of them are female. So immediately we see that our male colleagues are more likely to be top inventors than our female colleagues over this time period. But nevertheless, 10%, you know, they're definitely, and that number has been growing over the last 15 years, but that is what we see on average over that time period. Interestingly, that's quite similar to the ratio of female top inventors and male top inventors in industry as well. Uh, so it's a quite similar pattern. But then we ask, if you take all the patents that these top inventors have, who includes more female new inventors? You know, who brings women, newly trained women along with them on this kind of invention journey? And we actually see that female top inventors are much more likely or a bit more likely to include other women, probably PhD students in their patents relative to their male counterparts. Now, again, we dug into this because we really wanted to understand, you know, what's going on here? Some of this difference can really be explained by the fact that female academics and professors are much more likely to have female graduate students um, in their labs. And so that is part of what's really happening here. But we've done some additional work where we've looked at who people's PhD students are. And if you take a male and a female professor who's an inventor like this, and then you look at their graduate students, it turns out that the male and female professors are equally likely to include male faculty, male or female students in their patents, but they're both more likely to include male graduate students than female graduate students. So if we take a minute just to think about that. It means if I'm a male or female graduate student and I'm sitting in a lab, it doesn't matter whether it's a male or female professor, the male graduate student is considerably more likely to be included in some innovation oriented commercial science project to be on the patent than the female graduate student. So this is something that we don't fully understand the mechanism of this, but we're starting to uncover. And so for us going from this very large data set of, you know, 250,000 patents down to these micro dynamics that are happening in the lab, you know, part of what you asked me to talk about was who's in the lab. My question is who's in the lab, but then who's on the particular projects. So women are increasingly in the lab, but are they being included in these really interesting commercial science projects that are often the ones that give our graduate students the opportunity to train and get those skills around commercialization? They're also the projects that may turn into new ventures. And so there's work to do, 
that we're able to identify these patterns at the faculty level, which I think means, again, that faculty themselves can learn more about their practices and their habits and their behaviors. Because I think for most of us, when, when we see data about bias, we assume that's somebody else, but we're all humans and humans have unconscious bias. And this data helps us understand that about ourselves, which then allows us, I think, to change our practices. And so that's really the purpose of this sort of study. Again, it's not to beat people over the head, uh, but rather to kind of really shine the light on how we might make a difference in this sort of work. So let me just move a little bit from research and invention to entrepreneurs. So we definitely find some consistent patterns that even allowing for STEM training, women are less likely to found companies. So this is some data based on MIT alum uh, by decade of graduation. And you can really see that, so this is broken down by male and female graduates. And it talks about whether or not within five years of graduation, uh, have you founded a company or been involved in entrepreneurship as a co-founder um, or joining a very early stage company? And so we see that there's definitely, it continues to be some gender disparity. And that while the, perhaps in the 1960s, the rate of entrepreneurship was, you know, only at 3% and the same for men and women, you know, there were very, very few female undergraduates at MIT and the rates of entrepreneurship were incredibly low. But as ventures and the startup venture economy has, has gone on to flourish, male graduates have got deeply involved in that, whereas our female graduates have not. So this, we have, you know, over, over time and over people's careers, you know, uh, the, the sort of steady state ratio looks like it's about a two to one ratio in terms of the likelihood of becoming a, a venture founder. And that's definitely more balanced than you might see in the economy overall. So MIT grads, as just a sample of very technical um, young people, are definitely more likely to be engaged. But still, I think we have a long way to go. When we look at venture funding, we know that venture deals by the gender of the CEO, only about 11% of those venture deals um, go to female-led businesses. It's a little bit better in pharma and biotech, but actually this is something, and you know, Boston does not particularly well relative to um, Silicon Valley, New York, Los Angeles. Los Angeles numbers, I think, are probably shaped by some of the particular sectors, but this quite low participation in pharma and biotech is obviously something that uh, my colleague, Professor Susan Hopfield, and uh, Professor Nancy Hopkins have thought about considerably, because this is the place where we ought to be seeing things happening at a much higher rate, given that we're already at 50% when it comes to PhD students. And we know that women definitely want to participate into the, in the entrepreneurial economy. I mean, it doesn't matter where in the world we go, male and female and, you know, show and demonstrate equal interest in entrepreneurship and, and uh, equal sort of engagement in that, but we're just not seeing that in terms of who's taking their ideas out of the lab. Now, this is a totally unreadable chart. I don't want to ask you to read it, but when my colleagues, um, Waverly Ding and Toby Stewart and I did this work, we looked at this sample of about 6,000 academic scientists of, of whom about 20% were female. So these are life science faculty members. We basically asked, you know, what percent of, so some reasonably small fraction of those have become scientific advisory board members. So they joined the scientific advisory board of, of biotech companies. So we're not saying founding, the founding rates for women are incredibly low, but we're just saying, have you been invited to be on a scientific advisory board? And we found that in that cohort of biotech companies that were created, only 7% of those SAB members are female. And so we've got 20% of the faculty are female, but only, you know, 70% of science, 7% of scientific advisory board members are female. And so, you know, men are more than twice as likely to, to be on those boards. And those rates are very consistent with the differences in founding, which are really low for women. And sometimes people will say to me, oh, that's because women are not interested. I don't know about any of you um, out there, but, you know, is that really true? I don't think so. That certainly wouldn't be true of myself. But people say to me, oh, you're not on boards because you're not interested. Not really. The actual answer, and I did some qualitative research among colleagues, is that female faculty express equal interest in participating in scientific advisory boards and in venture activities, but they're very rarely invited. I think this is shifting, but there is much, they are much less likely to receive an invitation to sit at the table 
an invitation to not just be in the lab, but in the boardroom, uh, to not just be in the lab, but to be you know, pitching their new ventures. I think we are seeing some really significant changes in the way in which programs are being configured in what used to be the informal knowledge of how to patent and how to commercialize being spread. But we still see very few role models and there's still, I think, a lot of work to be done. It's also true that women tend to differentially select into different areas of invention. So for example, women's health. So again, some very nice work in science by my colleague um, Koenig et al, which I commented on in a piece, a perspective piece recently, that basically showed that women are more likely in the life sciences to select into areas of things like women's health. And we certainly see women more likely to participate in entrepreneurship and ed tech and health tech and social entrepreneurship. But none of that set of preferences really explains why it is that we just don't see the kind of level of participation, I don't think. So the last thing I want to just talk about before we perhaps open this up to a bit of discussion is really to say, so I've sort of provided a kind of supply and demand point of view. You know, what's the supply of women into academia and academic science and then into commercial science? What's the demand? You know, are people being invited to participate in certain activities? But I think it's really helpful for us to take a more system-wide perspective. And so in this piece in science called Mothers of Invention, which highlights this ophthalmologist Patricia Barr, who um, you know, is a, was a very prolific patenter, but really, I think, under-discussed and perhaps not heralded for some of her extraordinary accomplishments, rather like many women inventors. I think it's really important that we explain the gaps in participation and focus on these patterns, but to think about the systemic barriers. Because in, as far as I'm concerned, low levels of participation often lead to fewer role models and lower perceptions of fit. So if I don't see people like me, ahead of me in that uh, set of activities, I don't think I fit and I don't think I belong. And so I may be less likely to step forward. Not only do I not think I fit, but the people making evaluations of my company, of my pitch, of my grants also don't think I fit. And so they discount what I'm producing and what I'm presenting. And so you get, I think, this rather negative. So that gets amplified, it amplifies unconscious bias and it drives us towards lower engagement and lower investment. And so we end up with this really negative sort of cycle. And I think it's really important for us that we take a systems approach to recognize that we need to intervene in the system in many ways to go from this negative cycle to really turn that system and cycle around in the opposite direction. And I just want to leave you with one very specific example of something that we've been trying to do, which is actually to celebrate. And I think this is really consistent with the role of the Rosalind Franklin Society, which is to celebrate women in innovation and entrepreneurship, because it's all too easy for us to reach to convenient examples, to find a convenient image, uh, to add to our magazine article, to um, teach a case study, you know, on a very well-known male entrepreneur. And if we do that, if we reach for what's convenient and what's for, what is front of mind and where the numerical majority is, we're going to have mostly role models that are white and male. We actually have to, I think, consciously be more consciously inclusive and so let's make that easier. Let's reduce the frictions. Let's celebrate, you know, our extremely diverse and incredibly capable uh, young innovators and entrepreneurs. I think as we do that, we're going to start to shift the system. And let's make sure that all the sorts of support mechanisms that we have for patenting and commercialization and training, you know, are made explicit, normative and kind of widely available because it's much more difficult to rely on those informal networks to figure things out when you are still unusual uh, in taking on some of these challenges. So I think this might be um, a good place to stop. Like any good academic, I could go on for hours about this and show you an infinite number of tables and what have you, but let me stop and I'd be really happy to be open to questions, any sort of conversation that you'd like to have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fiona, that was amazing. Um, Carla, do you wanna start with some questions or shall I? With all of your roots in the UK, um, and your work worldwide. Is the lack of innovation and the lack of diversity a uniquely US problem? No. 
I think it would be fair to say that it is definitely not a uniquely US uh, problem. Um, you know, I work with a lot of, let me call it sort of very deep science organizations, whether they be major government labs, um, universities, you know, large global corporations. Um, I think that this is very much a, a global problem. I think when we look around for solutions, though, we can find different sources of inspiration in different countries. So, for example, in the UK, they have something called, I think it's called Project Athena Swan, which basically evaluates university departments on some of what they're doing around diversity and inclusion. And that actually shapes the likelihood of departments getting certain kinds of department level grants. But that would be hard to translate into the US context, because in the UK, grants are given at the department level as well as to individual PIs. But I think that's a national level program that I think is a very powerful one. Um, there are other really interesting places in the world to look for some inspiration. So one of the countries that has actually a striking number of women in science and innovation in STEM education and PhDs is actually in the Middle East and is in Saudi. Um, and, you know, that's totally, I think, not what we would anticipate given, you know, some of the, the stereotypes and, and some of what we observe. Um, some of this is the, the fact that there are some um, more segregated universities um, and that academia is actually a career and a profession where women have considerably more freedom to be able to do their work um, in sort of some less complex organizational environments. Um, but I do think that's quite interesting that there are definitely places where you do have these higher percentages. There's also in the UAE some really striking and interesting science particularly being done around um, space projects and the Minister for Science is um, a quite young woman who's incredibly inspirational, who's built a very young and incredibly diverse team. And so countries that are actually starting their science economy, if you like, and their scientific organizations from scratch, potentially I think are doing some new and different things and are just great places for us to look for inspiration. So I would highly recommend that and I'm happy to talk some more about those people, but yeah. So we see some of that, which is really interesting. Really interesting, and the, the difference between the culture and what we might expect in terms of the role of women and what's happening in universities. Um, related to that, um, your focus on the innovation economy, I think, is certainly new for many of us. Um, but worldwide, for the innovation economy, is the US leading or lagging, or is it just similar to other countries? Um, you mean in general or with respect to inclusion? Focusing on, foc on inclusion um, yes. in the innovation economy. Yeah. The US is probably about, the same. I mean, this is a fairly global phenomenon that we see. Again, interestingly, in some countries where capital allocation, particularly venture, is reasonably new. And again, I point to, interestingly, to the Middle East, where there's a lot of new entrepreneurial activity. We're seeing more funds being led by women. So we see many more female investors. And whenever we see more female investors, so people who control the money, um, we tend to see more women being recipients of that investment. And so there are definitely countries, they tend to be smaller economies and places that are newer at this, um, where we're beginning to see change um, at the venture level. It's also fair, I think, to say that in some of the Scandinavian countries, there's been a particular focus on having more women on boards and things like that. Um, and mm. that is certainly then translating into more uh, gender inclusion in their innovation economy. Uh, so we definitely are seeing that. The US is, is, is certainly not better than anywhere else, and it's, but it's largely not worse. And there are a few pockets of really, of, of really interesting excellence um, but it's still, there's a long way to go. If you look at the UK, Australia, you know, um, Germany, still very challenging. I think the one ray of hope is that, in fact, you have documented that it is improving. So I guess yes, we should. That's right. I mean, the improvement, rates are, the improvement rates are slow. And one of the disappointing things is that during COVID, um, we actually saw the percent of venture funding that's gone to women go down, not up. And I think that the reason for that is that during COVID, we've all had to rely on the networks we already have because we can't just randomly bump into somebody. You can basically only Zoom with somebody you plan to Zoom with. <laughs> There's no serendipity in Zoom. Um, and and 
in it. There are obviously other platforms where there are, but, and so I think what that's meant is that we, investors have gone to the usual suspects to continue with their investment activities. And it's been pretty extraordinary that they can continue to do that quite effectively. But what that has meant is that the networks, I think, have become, the social networks have actually become less diverse, a little less inclusive. They become more geographically dispersed, but less inclusive. So I think a lot of investors are beginning to really try to pay attention and recognize that post COVID, or at least as we at least start to live with COVID, um, they are much more explicit about inclusion and about who they bring in, who's pitching, how they're thinking about, who they're evaluating. So I think there's more attention and there's more attention from the limited partners, the people who control the money. So my view, until the people who control the money actually say they care, not very much is going to happen. And yeah. it's very impressive to see Yale and the um, the individuals who lead the Yale endowments and the Yale investments actually coming out explicitly talking about requirements, who they're going to invest in and yeah. just wanting to see more diversity. And I think until the people with the money say that they care, I'm not sure enough will happen. It will always be a bit of an uphill struggle. We'll move. One last question before I hand this to um, Juliana for her bursting questions. Do you see the development in science graduate programs similar to um, leading what's going on in business schools? Are business schools focusing on this leadership initiative related to inclusion also? Uh, yes. So I would certainly say, I mean, you know, part of my expanded responsibilities at the management school here at MIT has been to focus on um, innovation, but also inclusion. And I think in management schools and business schools, because we've spent a lot of time thinking about and studying organizations, we are probably more um, attuned to some of the language and the mechanisms by which systematic um, sort of lack of inclusion and systematic exclusion happens. And so actually, I think some of the management schools are leading some of the thinking about this. The thing that we have to then do is translate that knowledge into understanding these very deep scientific and engineering organizations, whether it be our engineering schools, our schools of science or academic research labs and institutes or national labs. Um, because it's such a complicated system, there's no magic bullet. And I think that's really frustrating. Engineers sort of get it because I can say, this is a system. We need to intervene in many places. Um, and they do really appreciate the evidence. But so I do think that the management schools have been quite leading in, in at least documenting the phenomenon. And working together. I think that's great. And working collaboratively, which I think is really interesting and important actually. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Sorry, Juliana, didn't mean to take up all your time here, but this is fascinating and really- No, no, not at all. Not at all. I'm actually gonna start with a great question from an audience member, Claudia says, great lecture, thank you. And Claudia wants to know if the chair of an SAB is a woman, is the probability to have more women in the committee higher? Uh, so Claudia, that's a very good question. Um, I actually don't know the answer to that. I haven't. So it's quite difficult to collect who's on the SAB. And it's not always the case that the person who chairs the SAB is um, documented in a way that is easy to access from a public uh, point of view. So my guess is that it would be the case. So now that we actually have two female co-chairs of the President's Council uh, or President's Advisory Council on Science and Technology, PCAST, my guess is that that is actually going to lead to some quite distinctive composition. And I think that's a really important moment, actually, that we should celebrate. Um, you know, two very, very accomplished and extraordinary scientists from either side of, um, of the continent here. Um, I think in terms of investment, as I say, we know that when you have uh, women as part of investment decision making, we, you tend to see more women being invested, businesses being invested in. So it's almost surely the case that we would find that if we had the information. Um, the other thing that we don't know that I think we ought to figure out is when you have, for example, a shift in who is the CTO or the head of R&D, the VP of R&D in, in a large corporation, you know, if that shifts from being male to female or being somebody um, 
you know, somebody of uh, color or an underrepresented minority, does that make a difference in the way in which that organization goes on to hire? Um, I think it's something we don't know, but would be really important for us to start to document and understand because there are other scientific organizations than just academic ones. I think we have to understand the entirety of these deep science organizations throughout the economy. Um, and another question is, because as you were saying, I mean, sometimes it just takes kind of calling this to someone's attention to say, so, and I ran into this myself when I'm writing stories. And if I say, can, can you give me the name of an expert, for example? And then the names, if the names are all men, and then I say, actually, can, you know, how about some women? And then, and then somebody will say, oh, of course, you know, but, but those weren't actually the first names necessarily given. This is not across the board, of course, but so, but sometimes it just takes asking, right? So then the question I guess I have is how in, in putting women in, in all the rooms where it happens, you know, yeah. how can the message get out that just asks? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think you're right. It's like how, I, I think that's a beautiful way of putting it. How do we make sure that women are in all the rooms where it happens? Um, one of the ways that we've tried to do this in some of the work we've done here at MIT is to say, you know, when you have, when you're shortlisting candidates and what have you, you know, you have to have a certain number of women in the shortlist, a certain number of underrepresented minorities. We're not saying you have to hire one of those people but we need to have a short list that is reasonably representative. And sometimes people come back and say, oh, we can't do that, it's impossible. And my response is try harder because there's no evidence that there's a lack of qualified individuals. I think on things like boards, that's especially true. Um, you know, people have asked me, should we have quotas and things? And I think that's, on the one hand, I think it's problematic. I think it's a pity. On the other hand, what it does is it fixes the mind to saying you have to try harder. And once people do that, suddenly they find these really long lists of highly qualified individuals. And so, you know, maybe we only need a quota for a year and then we can get rid of it because we've all worked out that it's just not so hard. And so I think we have to keep asking the question, you know, can we have a diverse group of experts? When I organize any one of my classes and I have visitors and panels, I work really hard to make sure that I have diverse panels. And even for me, you know, female representatives are not always top of mind. The names that always come to mind, you know, may not be as diverse as I need them to be. And I have to go away and do extra work. Absolutely. Yeah. And well, that's why visibility is so important as well. And just getting, yeah. you know, like different, whether it's social media, online things that are bringing everybody just out into the, out into the light, you know? Yes. Um, Actually, your last point brought up another question I have, which is like, as you were saying in your talk, you know, we need to, for example, include more graduate students and things like that kind of from the bottom up. But what about um, initiatives like the one you were talking about? And I, I remember Carla one from an RFS annual meeting. I think it was the New York Stem Cell Foundation. Do you remember this? Yeah. And they made these sweeping top-down rules about funding. And they said, you know, your, your grant is not going to even go in unless you have X, Y, and Z. And I, I forget the details, Yeah. Mm -hmm. but for them, and they had data as well, it was really quite effective. So, I mean, do you, do you think more in your work about those types of initiatives about these types of initiatives or just, do we just need all of them? <laughs> I mean, I think the sorry answer is we need all of them. And the only thing I hesitate when I say that is I, it makes me feel slightly tired, you know, exhausted <laughs> when I think about how much we need to keep doing authentically for so long. Yeah. Um, I think the systems approach that we try to take and that I try to think a lot about asks the question, what's the, where are the highest leverage points? because there is so much to be done, we need to allocate our time kind of effectively. I, I think that some of the, you know, the bottom up, making sure that every individual really understands, especially people who run labs and at high levels of organization, their role. I really think though that very highly visible top-down behaviors, mandates, requirements can really make an enormous difference. 
because I think they make a difference, not just in the specific outcomes that they drive, but actually in the message that they send. And I think as long as that those messages are sent, not in a sort of, again, a tokenistic kind of way, but actually saying, we really want diversity of opinion. And so we're gonna, and we have this evidence that that matters. So we're gonna require you to have grants of this kind, um, you know, interview panels or interview candidates, um, you know, I'm a senior leader, I'm not going to sit on the panel that's all met, right? So I think there've been a number of very senior leaders in the scientific community who've said, if this is a mammal, I won't show up. And mm -hmm. I think that's really important. Um, so that top down sort of sending that message, I think makes an enormous difference. So I, I do think those can be very high points of leverage, much like my comment about investment funds, but the limited partners, the endowment leads, I mean, all our universities have diversity statements and are making a commitment, but does their endowment management reflect that? I mean, it's a, it's a question I think we have to ask. If we're serious, then I think our endowment needs to reflect our beliefs as an institution. Um, that's a reasonably controversial point of view, but I think it's important for us to at least have the discussion. Mm -hmm. I have one more point from an audience member and then Carla, I think I'll pass it to you for the last question. Um, I can't believe we're almost out of time already. But Myra also brings up a great point about focusing on mid-level career women, um, meaning those who've been in independent positions in for a few years and those who would like to have more cross-sector experiences. So, you know, maybe not just women who are coming up, just graduating from PhDs, but you know, how can that group of, of women also be um, be important here? Yeah, so I, I mean, I think that's really important. And as I say, we've tried in our various studies to take sort of different slices through things. Um, I, I think there is often the point, again, if you look at pipelines in organizations, there'll be certain points where um, as you look at the representation of women in say an organizational hierarchy, you'll see that you know, male representation just goes up and female goes down, and it, you can't account for that just by, oh well, you know, when people started, there were even fewer women, and so on. I mean, so I think that th those middle rankings and what it takes to get into senior leadership, whether that's senior academic leadership, where I do think we've seen more progress, certainly in corporate leadership, I think that continues to be quite challenging. Um, there's a lot of things about leadership behaviours and what people consider convincing, what you have to look like, sound like, how you have to behave to seem leader-like, I think is quite gendered actually. And some of the studies that I've done that look at pitching and look at how men and women, um, you know, if you take the same pitch, but with a male and a female voice, people actually consider the male voice to be more convincing and more investable. It just tells us something about leadership performance. And I think in the mid-career for men and women, that's a very big issue. So I would say that some of the solutions to that are a little different, but that's incredibly important because as soon as we see those women being represented in senior leadership, I think that makes a huge change for everybody right at the beginning of their careers because they can see people who are like them ahead of them. If you could counsel your younger self, Fiona, would you recommend an MBA instead of a PhD? Uh, for my younger self, no. I mean, you know, doing my PhD. So first I chose to do my PhD in engineering science, which was, you know, that was pretty tough. I mean, being educated as a chemist didn't mean that I had perhaps as high level of math skills that I needed. So that was quite hard work. And I was also continuing to live in a very male environment. Um, but that gave me the foundational skills to then really do my current work, which is about the organization of science, science policy, again, how we create those organizational institutional conditions for really effective um, scientific and innovation oriented kind of organizations. Um, so no, I wouldn't actually. And, you know, being an academic is something that has allowed me to impact, I hope, the lives of a huge number of my students. Um, I'm very lucky, right? I get the best of both worlds because I also get to spend time advising and consulting governments and big organizations and ven new ventures and funds. So I, I feel as if I have an incredibly fortunate career path and that career path was at least in part dependent upon my doing the pretty hard grind that we all have of doing that PhD, which as it is for anybody and continues to be, it's really, it was a hard five years of my life, but 
I'm quite proud of myself for getting through and out the other end. Um, and I wouldn't change that. I might change the way I did it and the way I thought about it. And I would recommend to my young self to perhaps get out of the building a little more and take a more um, diverse set of classes and give myself some of those other managerial and business oriented skills. Um, so I didn't have to come to that little later in life. Yeah, no, I think it's a great um, opportunity to focus on looking at broader opportunities and the notion of an innovation economy is everywhere. Absolutely. Necessary. So I think that's great. It's great advice. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you're not sorry about your PhD. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, all right, well, that brings us to the end of our discussion and concludes our Women in Science series. I want to again thank Fiona and Carla for a terrific discussion, our team behind the scenes for making everything run so smoothly, and I want to thank all of you for joining us. Please keep your eyes peeled for information about the upcoming Rosalind Franklin Society annual meeting, which will be held in January 2022. It is always a terrific two-day event with an amazing lineup of speakers. Also, you'll be able to find today's event on demand on Jen's website. For everyone at Jen and the Rosalind Franklin Society, I'm Juliana Lemire. Stay safe, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks. Thanks, Fiona. Thank you. Thank you.